I, I forgot to um, uh, get ready one of my my, my visual aid. Um, touch, touch. I, I want. To... Yes. Oh, oh, touch, touch. touch. Yeah. I see what you. I see what you did there. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 7th of November 2022. I am joined as ever by my co-host Mr Andy Brockman and uh, as he might be able to tell I haven't yet de-decorated the office from Halloween. It's a bit cobwebby and ghouly behind me still. Are, uh, are, you, are you still operating by the Julian calendar so you're 12 days behind? <laughs> well I've been I've been ill. I'm trying to enjoy what I missed out on in that week of, of of fluey nightmare um but uh but no it, it's it'll be coming down by the end of the week don't worry don't worry uh anyway uh, uh regardless of, of 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 how outdatedly festive we are i mean i'm definitely not going to be decorating for christmas before december um our watching why, why why break the habit of most of the british retail sector oh yeah yeah uh, Anyway, our watching brief continues, and uh, we're going to start this week with a few news lines to keep an eye on. Um, uh, with uh, well, actually, I suppose first of all, with something that's quite close to to, to our mutual conversational heart as it were and that is the benin bronzes there's a project that's been announced called digital benin and um it's a it's a a catalog of seemingly every known uh, item that was looted by the british um and has been scattered around the world this is an interesting uh concept is it do you think the value of this is to attempt to uh, to keep track of what has been returned what hasn't been returned and, and what it means to potentially return items well yeah uh, to to explain this is a um a, a group of museums and international scholars mm. who've put together a, a very comprehensive database there's an extremely good website uh that the project has uh, created it's been funded by one of the big uh, german-based uh art charities in fact the Ernst von Siemens Art Foundation mm. uh, it's a 1.5 million euro project and um it, it I, I just really uh urge anyone that's got an interest in the in the Benin bronzes to look at it and look at the background documentation that they provided um the catalog of artifacts um it's uh, it's a, a thoroughly in international project the claim is that uh and i just need to check the figures here we go um they reckon that they've catalogued over 5200 objects hmm. um they come from 131 separate institutions you know galleries museums private collectors whatever um and uh, the, they're distributed now across 20 countries mm. and these are the objects that were taken by the british armed forces in early 1897 um mm. in during the so-called punitive action mm -hmm. um against the then kingdom of benin mm. in what's now nigeria um it's a really important resource for the ongoing debate about what should actually happen to the benin bronzes and uh, you know the british museum is currently in discussions with the government of Nigeria about ownership and mm. restoration and loan, mm -hmm. particularly because the British Museum has it le the kind of legal issues we've discussed before about uh, deaccessioning artifacts from its collections. But um, I, th I think just in, even in the last six months, the tectonic plates of the Benin bronzes issue have really moved with uh, places. I think you know from Aberdeen to Germany, returning Benin objects to Nigeria. Um, yeah. And um, this is part of that. This is part of that debate. Part of that process. It gives a a, a, a strong foundation to it, it, it. You know, it gives a physicality to to the to the debate because it actually lists the, and shows the objects. Mm. Mm. I think uh, was it was it Martin Luther King, uh, the long arc of history bends towards mm. justice. Um, yes. I mean, we are. Uh, the, you may you may have noticed if people are, are watching as opposed to listening to this, as I was uh, uh, giving a wry smile every now and then uh, during Andy's up some, and it's mainly because this is something that we do come back to, and it's something that uh, that that I I think it's 
it, I can understand why people get a bit frustrated and confused as to how and why it is that the, the museums like the BM are tied up in so much uh, tape and, and rules and deaccession um, uh, protocol uh, when it looks possibly as though, the, you know, it could be a simple matter of, of justice. But we both know it's not. It is. It is complicated, definitely. And um, and it, and but 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 uh, matters like this are definitely helping, or or uh, efforts like this. Um, on a related note, I'm just going to quickly insert into our agenda. Um, there's also news of uh, we've been seeing a company, um, who have uh, been um sculpting out of marble, uh, copies of the uh the the sculptures that that currently live in the the Elgin Hall or the Parthenon Marbles Hall in the British Museum the Parthenon Marbles uh and and that that kind of news those the uh, also adds to this weight this this bend towards justice I think uh I, I mean we've talked previously with regards to the Benin bronzes that 3D printing technology now with you know extremely good color matching and and so on and so forth uh, along with this, in this instance, um, mechanical sculpture of marble could actually mean that it's possible to have a long-term, extremely long-term loan while legal issues are uh, are hammered out, um, but still still have copies, very accurate copies of these artifacts in our museums. Now, obviously, you've talked, you've made a, not sorry, talked, you've made an excellent um, argument previously about the the cultural value for people. Uh, for example, with Nigerian, her Nigerian heritage living in London today to go and be able to see this stuff in person, so we're not we're not going to relitigate that. But as you say, it's interesting that that the, the plates are shifting, and it may well be that um, that no one has to totally lose out on these issues, and I think that's that's an interesting development, certainly. Um, Speaking of losing out, uh, the results are in at the National Trust, uh, the annual general meeting where they um, voted in various key positions in the organisation. Um, uh, the AGM took place on the 5th of November uh, and, well, the, 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 the long-standing, somewhat controversial group, campaign lobbying group, uh, Restore Trust, didn't you mean you mean the the alleged entries uh, from Restore Trust who are opaquely funded and have clear links to right wing think tanks, including the Institute of Economic Affairs, the people that were behind the economic policy of Liz Trust? Uh, yes, the British economy. Yes, that's right. it. Yes, yes. Uh, those people, they the, none of them, none of their candidates were voted in uh, to the National Trust. Membership rejected them, it seems. Um, but they are crying foul, are they not? Yeah, um, new viewers start here. The, um, uh, Restore Trust is a pressure group, basically, mm. um, that was set up a couple of years ago and uh, by a, uh, a supposedly completely independently by somebody who just happens to also have uh, been involved in one of the uh, leading climate change denying pressure groups that are based at a place called 55 Tufton Street. Mm. um in 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 london there's a there's a, a nexus of right of center economic and political think tanks that operate out of tufton street and the area around it mm -hmm. um which have attempted to effectively take over british policy making in the in in, in the conservative government yeah um and um backed by particularly the daily telegraph newspaper uh but also to a certain extent the daily mail uh the uh Restore Trust have been pushing against what they claim is the National Trust woke agenda. And they um, fielded not just a slate of candidates for the National Trust Council, uh, which is the basically the advisory body that um, sets National Trust policy. Um, but there were also a whole series of um, mo motions that went to the National Trust AGM on the 5th of November, Guy Fawkes Night last Saturday, um, which opposed, for example, the National Trust participating in rewilding um, and also um, the participation in pride events for LGBTQ plus community. Okay. Um, yeah. a, 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 that's a, for some reason, that's a particular touchstone for people who are concerned that our history is being introduced and devalued. Um, equal, you know, Human rights for people from that community is somehow something not to be celebrated. But anyway, that's um, that's by the by. Um, I, bet, I bet they love a good Oscar Wilde quote, though. 
Yes, I mean, yeah, th- anyway, <laughs> there are so, there are there are so many contradictions within this. Um, anyway, cut to the chase. Uh, cut to the chase. The motions were all uh, defeated, and the candidates, the slate of candidates that they put forward, were also all defeated. None of them were elected. Um, the Restore Trust has cried foul. It says that the National Trust uh, senior management team. Um, pl- basically gained the electoral system for the annual general meeting, although in fact all the mechanisms that were used were all laid out in a handbook um, that was sent to National Trust members with the voting forms and also the um, the National Trust votes are actually overseen by a separate independent um, voting services body. Right. So um, I think that, that, uh, we think they doth protest too much in, in, in many respects. Um, the other thing about um, the, um, the, the, they they are also, cla- um, there was also a, a motion uh, put forward, in fact, by the Stonehenge Alliance, um, asking the trust to withdraw its support for the Stonehenge Tunnel and A303 upgrade project on the Stonehenge and Avery World Heritage Site. Again, something we've talked about a lot before. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't carried, I- that wasn't carried either. Um, no. So at the moment, National Trust management policy is still to support the the tunnel and upgrade. Mm-hmm. Okay, but nonetheless, that's I mean, presumably restore trust aren't going anywhere. But it's interesting to see uh, to see to see that actually the the mood of the of the membership is um, uh, is not particularly receptive. Well, it, it's interesting that uh, apparently um, the National Trust has said that the turnout of members actually voting. Um, and it's still a relatively small number within a membership or, or organization with a membership that runs into the millions. Yes. Uh, well into the millions. It's about six million. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual membership uh, voting is much smaller than that. But the turn up, what the turnout of members voting was actually up this year. And um, people who follow these issues on social media will be aware that there's been a lot of pushback against Restore Trust. Mm. Um, Restore Trust has had a very active social media policy, but they can't post something without a lot of other people coming back in and saying, principally, who funds you? Yeah. Um, Yeah. The idea that uh, that Restore Trust isn't actually a grassroots membership organisation, which it presents itself as, as, but is in fact what's called an AstroTurf organisation, which is something that's um, set up to look like something that's grassroots but actually isn't and the, the puppeteers are actually as it's alleged in this case the it, groups like the institute of Ec- economic affairs and uh, and others um where many of the leading members of restore trust both on in its management and its uh, and its senior uh, it, 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 um, its guiding body um have have direct proven links mm, yeah well, speaking of 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 the Tuf- Tufton Street lot and the anti um, uh, anti anti eco, do, do we still use the term eco? I know, so I know on on Twitter people are saying you know eco zealots and this kind of thing. Uh, isn't eco a bit nineties? Anyway, the the an- <laughs> the eco Taliban. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The people who spend their time arguing that oh, you know, climate change is nothing to worry green about. Green zealots. Yeah, well, green. Yes, not those people. I mean, the people who oppose the green zealots, the anti-green zealots, um, who apparently are currently uh, uh, someone at least some sort of zealot is trying to interrupt your broadcast by cruelly redirecting the sun at the at the uh, the webcam. There, it's quite impressive. Um, I, I, I have to say, it's, 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 for, for our view, it, it starts off this morning with my next door neighbour was building a very large boat to put his pets in two by two. Yeah, yeah, but um, it's, it's just... it, yeah. As, as you can see, the uh, morning has broken somewhat later, and uh, yeah, the sun is blitzing through. Do you want me to move the? Uh, yeah, but go the, ahead, go ahead. I'll 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 move us on into the next set segment anyway. But the, <laughs> okay. the whole point, is, the the point being though that the the people who are arguing against uh, needs to mitigate climate change. I'm uh, not sure that's any better, by the way. I'm still feeling as on. No, uh, I'm, I'm definitely side. Definitely but, better. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, okay. Those people are. Um, are currently very uh, um, hot on the topic of COP27, um, currently happening in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, and uh, uh, where our former prime minister is attempting to um, reinvigorate his legacy. Resurrect his career? Yeah, yeah. Uh, And the current prime minister... Have you you heard the latest this morning? No. Apparently, um, Boris Johnson, our 
previous but one prime minister. We have to remember this. We've yeah, been getting yeah. through them like they were going out of fashion this yeah. year. Um, but um, uh, yeah, uh, Boris, Boris Johnson um, said he'd been invited there as the um, uh, uh, because he, he had organised or his government had organised the previous COP in Glasgow mm-hmm. last year, mm-hmm. um, and uh, to, he he'd been invited to therefore take part in in the in the current COP. Um, the fact that he uh, the day after he announced that he was going. The current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said that he was also going to go, having said previously that he wasn't going to go, mm. um, was was quite entertaining. Uh, but then this morning, apparently, um, it is reported, it is being reported, that Boris Johnson has taken a private jet, himself personally now, back to Britain, and that he's actually meeting one of his uh, close friends and associates who's a climate change sceptic. Ah. Um, so there was him and then yes as you say there was our, our current prime minister who had to be drag kicking and screaming and or under the you know the the, the threat of being outstaged by a, his buffoonish former colleague and predecessor um all of this is 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 to say that actually uh it's, it's, it's these are interesting times that's something to keep an eye on certainly um in terms of climate change and uh, and the uk and our attitude to, our leaders attitudes to climate uh, change issues um uh but also as well that, that these issues continue to be uh crucial for people who who do archaeology in terms of preservation of monuments in terms of working outside uh, during the digging season which is increasingly becoming a monsoon season here in the uk uh, and also as well for the the medium to long term uh, survival of this, all the different structures that that organisations like the National Trust rely on in order to get feet through the door and and uh, membership uh, paid and bums on seats. So uh, it's 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 something that's happening, something to keep an eye on. And if anything comes out of it that 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 will impact uh, the history uh, and heritage sector, archaeology, etc., uh, we'll comment on that next week, I think. But um, yeah, these are interesting times. Well, they continue to be interesting times that we're living in. Uh, not least because today uh, the US is going to the polls for the midterms, aren't they? And that may also That's have right. an, imp- an impact on essentially the Western world's attitude to climate change, uh, depending on on which way they go uh, in the House and the Senate. So um, we'll see. We'll see what, what what's going on there. Again, these are just the new li- news lines to keep an eye on. We'll have links, relevant links below to go and check out. And yeah. there's, in fact, there's there's one other uh, news line just quickly while we're talking about uh, the, the the wider political context in which archaeology and heritage activities take place. Um, or a week on Thursday, seventeenth uh, of November, I think it is. Um, the uh, British government, uh, Rishi Sunak's government, are producing their budget statement or their their, their financial statement. Mm. It's not not formally a budget, um, mm. but um, it, it it's being widely trailed that the government is going to seek to pay for the, well, the tanking of the economy by a Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, but also the money that was spent on things like COVID support for businesses and the furlough scheme and so on by making very large cuts in public spending, um, up to 20% being talked about, so a, a fifth of departmental budgets going forward, not necessarily all at once, but certainly over the foreseeable future. Um, and that will have a significant impact uh, both on education um, and other important public services, particularly health service, but also on other things that are provided in, in, in the public interest, like, for example, local authority planning. Mm. Uh, local authority planning departments have been hollowed out over the past 10 years since austerity 1.0 in 2010. Um, and um, also things like local authority funded museums and so on. And this is becoming just at a time when, for example, museums and libraries are making plans to be what are so-called warm spaces to welcome people who are having trouble heating their homes under the cost of living crisis, Mm. the energy crisis. Yeah, yeah. For one one of the wealthiest countries on the planet, you do wonder where all the money's gone. Well, actually, you don't do you. It's gone. It's gone upwards. It's got. It's just, just gone. Well, away. Uh, well <laughs> people quote. Uh, the, 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 was it uh, uh, hundreds of millions on uh, track and trace that didn't work during COVID? Mm. Uh, not to mention the um, strange um, companies that opened, pocketed very lo- uh, large 
contracts and then seem to disappear. Mm. Um, and, and that's just the start, which, again, Rishi Sunak is... Um, Chancellor in his previous incarnation in the government um, attracted a lot of criticism for actually not wanting to investigate uh, fraud in he the, wrote it in, off in yeah. COVID procurement. Yeah, he wrote they, yeah. they just wrote it off. So they wrote it off, was, and yet now it has to all be paid for by the general taxpayer, by and large. Yeah, and and in that sense, oh, oh, the humanities are going to take a disproportionate hit on that. Okay, and, and, and in fact, actually, just one other quick, very quick news line. You mentioned the humanities there. Um, we've had a so-called bonfire of the humanities going on for some time. Yeah, the latest university to uh, to say that it's uh, planning to cut humanities departments is um, Birkbeck College of the University of London. Oh, and of I, I have to say, yeah, um, cards on the table. I'm actually a Birkbeck graduate. You're a Birk, um, and I. I'm a bird. Yes, <laughs> people are saying. People have said many, many times, and and, 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 and in more colourful terms than that. Um, but um, no, I, I mean, I'm, but for people who aren't aware of Birkbeck, it's a college of the University of London. It's a fantastic institution that has, for over 200 years now, has provided education to people coming into university level education from um, non-traditional paths. So for mm. example, people who are working and maybe didn't do particularly well at school with A-levels or whatever, and didn't go straight to university, coming in as, as, as so-called mature students yeah. and um, uh, uh, working with some very fine academics and scholars. Mm. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, and personally, I'm very sad to see that the Axe appears to be about to fall, particularly on things where Birkbeck has been really strong in the past. English and creative writing, it has mm. a very high reputation for. Mm. Um, and yet that is looking to take a very a, a big hit. There is a petition online um, and there's hope that at least some of the cuts will be um, ameliorated. But it's just indicative of the state of the sector at the moment. A combination of... Um, sector-wide factors like the removal of caps on student numbers making the markets very competitive mm. um and um the what just the, the wider uh and, and, and also uh, sort of local issues in terms of um, budgets and so on yeah um, so yeah well another well, sad instance yeah well again we'll, we'll we'll definitely keep an eye on that and if anything uh pertinent occurs we will report back on that as well yeah. uh and uh, i suppose with all of that in mind, um, here is a message from our sponsor, namely us, and uh, we'll be back after the break with Tutankhamun. A Watching Brief is a formal programme of observation and investigation to record and report on notable discoveries on an archaeological site. As part of our ongoing Watching Brief, Andy and I work hard to bring you the best, the worst and sometimes the more quirky happenings from the world of archaeology. We aim to provide a space where voices can be heard, opinions shared and sometimes truth spoken to power. If you believe in the work we do, please consider supporting us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for that wonderful message about our Patreon. Uh, he's so he's got such a lovely voice, that guy. I mean, oh, I don't know if I, if I wasn't happily you, married. You th you th <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. I am not going there. Uh, um, yeah, no, in all seriousness, with, with all the news that we've just been laying out and also actually bit, uh, during the break, and you know, I was having a quick chat about, about the state of the world. And yeah, you, you, you've got to take your, you've got to take your laughs where you can at the moment, certainly. And also you've got to look for good news where you can find it. And uh, in the past few days, in fact, four days ago, we saw the uh, 100th, anniversary of the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt in the Valley of the Kings uh, it's it's it, it's you know it's, it's, a, it's an archaeological discovery that needs no real introduction it, it simply is probably the most famous thing ever discovered if Stonehenge is the most famous archaeological monument Tutankhamun is almost certainly the most famous archaeological discovery and or tomb uh, and uh, yeah November the 4th um, 2022 was was the hundredth anniversary of its discovery. That top step 
uh, being uncovered uh, in the Valley of the Kings. And I think, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we don't want to retread too much of that. I mean, I've been posting yeah. some some old Tutankhamun videos on TikTok, and I'll probably link to, to those videos from the YouTube channel in the links below for you guys to watch. But I think we were both struck by the the inescapable gravity of that discovery. It sort of shaped and formed almost how archaeology is done, certainly in the public eye. Uh, and it still continues to to affect how, certainly, for example, how journalists look to, 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 to find what's interesting about an archaeological site for their readers, doesn't it? Absolutely. And the um, it's interesting that I, I was doing some uh, reading around uh, in preparation for, obviously, uh, no, we're going to discuss it, uh, discuss it today, but also uh, for some uh, tweets I put out on on, on Saturday because um, I um, I wanted to uh, make sure that, for example, it, it was remembered that that first top step wasn't discovered by Howard Carter. No, mm -hmm. um, it was actually uh, discovered by one of his Egyptian digging crew. Mm. Um, it, it, there are conflicting accounts to who it actually was. It might have been somebody called Mohammed Gorga. Mm -hmm. um, who was interviewed in 1924 and um, by, by a report from the Boston Globe and um, said, uh, well, uh, didn't s s say either way whether it was true that he was the one that actually first noticed that step. Um, Zoe Hawass, the famous Egyptian archaeologist, former uh, briefly um, culture minister, um, uh, said it was um, one of Carter's water carriers, um, uh, uh, somebody called Hussein Abed El Rasul, uh, right. who comes from, uh, from a family that was um, quite prominent in the area of the Valley of the Kings at the time. Mm. Um, and um, he says that he heard that story from uh, Hussein Abed El Rasul in person. Um, so, but either way, you know, the, the tomb of Tutankhamun technically was found by an Egyptian. And I think one of the things that's been really interesting about it is that um, it's becoming more spoken about that the work that Carter and Carnarvon did, Carnarvon, Lord Carnarvon is the sponsor, mm. Carter is the archaeologist leading the expedition, was done absolutely in the context of official Egyptian archaeology at the time. Mm -hmm. And that uh, at the time... In Egypt, it was seen as a, a sign of a growing confidence in Egypt as a nation state. They become, a, you know, independent from the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. and um, so uh, and, and all the debates that we have now about colonialism, decolonization, and so on were going on as the tomb was being discovered and cleared. Mm. Um, at the same time, uh, I came across a wonderful piece, and again, we'll link to it in the um, in below the line, uh, but a um, a piece of uh, film that was found uh, from the British Film uh, Institute archive, which is a newsreel mm -hmm. of the tomb being um, objects being removed from the tomb while, by Carter's team. Uh, Carter himself appears, but it is absolutely clear that the, uh, the, the what we now call the videographer, the, the camera person who who shot the film, was doing it unofficially. Mm. Uh, you see the back of Carter's head and um, you see the, the some of the shots seem quite furtive. And the reason for that is that the Carnarvon expedition sold the worldwide rights to the Times of London. Um, so we have a piece of very modern yeah. media. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, the sort of, the sort of thing that, the sort of thing that today would have been someone on site with a mobile phone, you know. Absolutely. It, 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 it's like, hmm. it, 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 it's as though National Geographic have commissioned a top of the line documentary. Yeah. And somebody happens to walk past the site, as you say, with a mobile phone and post the video on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very modern, uh, a, ve a very modern slant on the story. And I think it, that's maybe one of the reasons, as well as the fact it's a, you know, the, the story of King Tutankhamun and the controversies and mysteries around his reign, what his parentage actually was, how he actually died at the age of around 18, 19. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which, which Egyptologists still talk about. The, the, the more recent controversies, for example, that you know, did Carter miss hidden chambers in the tomb, which are still there to, to be discovered? Some argue that they are there. Others say, no, the evidence is doesn't stack up. Mm. Uh, so 100 years later, we're still finding out 
there's still potential to find out new things there's still discussions to be had and in, and in fact just to finish up and show how how, how live it is I, I i'm doing um some teaching workshops at the moment with the local primary school and i was talking to the uh, coordinator yesterday i was working with the kids and she told me that after christmas um they ha uh, are going to be talking about the egyptians and tusan and one mm -hmm. of the questions they're going to be asking is was howard carter an archaeologist or was he a grave robber oh oh my that's uh yeah yeah hot topic uh, well it, it, and but it's also it's yeah absolutely well, could it, you be both it, it, it could be both it could be both because because you know as you say there are there are uh growing questions to be asked as to the nature of the material that was that was removed how that was removed and where it was taken to um the well the... It's, it's known for example that at least one object found its way out of egypt which would have been illegal yeah mm -hmm. um uh, and and um ended up um being sold at auction yeah uh, it's a, a, a petrol uh, uh piece that uh carter appears to have removed from egypt um and uh various claims are made about whether he did it deliberately or whether he got forgetful Just it was being taken away suitcase, from concert yes, yes it, was being, it was gonna it was he was gonna have it conserved and so on and and, and um forgot about it well it, it but but, uh, uh, but again actually that's an interesting word that you use conserved because actually uh i'm not i'm not arguing that 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 taking stuff out of the country is conserving it but actually carter's team did undoubtedly do a wonderful job of recording and conserving the contents of the yes. tomb um Indeed. so again it's a very human very messy story i mean the the as we've talked about pre in a previous watching brief there was a uh i don't think it's even a rumor now i think it's been shown to be the case that it's highly likely uh that they broke into the tomb the night before the official opening yes um and built a platform higher up against the entrance, obscuring the low down cuts that they'd made into the wall, just to or into the doorway, just to make sure that they weren't going to open up the tomb and to the world's press and have nothing be in there. Um, yes, and and that to me is fascinating because because when I first heard about that as a student, I thought that's disgusting. You know, that's 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 how could you? That's 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 false. You know, completely falsifying, and maybe even as we as we now might consider. Um, uh, more more immediately it's arguably you know uh, potentially um risking damage to material inside the tomb if you break a seal uh you know and let new air in or you know air movement and humidity and acidity and all this sort of stuff uh heat temperatures uh, heat heat uh, fluctuations um but 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 actually that pressure uh was so strong even then uh, and i think and in some ways it's, it's become in some ways stronger or it's certainly maintained that level of 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 strength you know you you have to have the story lots of archaeologists think in order for journalists to be interested um uh, and yet also i think uh there's another factor here and that is actually journalists are always interested in what archaeologists are doing so there's an interesting again it's 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 just fascinating to think about this stuff because 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 I think a lot of archaeologists fall into the trap of thinking they need to sell the story uh, yeah. uh and 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 it's clear that Howard Carter was no different you know um uh under pressure now didn't you say that he used to be he was um he was an official working in Egypt before he was he got this job as an archaeologist that's right he's got a quite a a fascinating and quite complicated sort of backstory, as we, we'd say now. Um, you know, he didn't come from a traditional sort of academic family. Mm. Um, and one of his early uh, early pre Tutankhamun jobs in, in Egypt was as, uh, I can't remember the exact title, but he was um, basically uh, uh, the, the director of monuments. Mm. Uh, he was in charge of looking after uh, the, the, the monuments for the Egyptian government and, and, and the and the security of them in fact mm, mm. and he got into a, a, he was fired after he got into an argument uh, between some of his uh, tomb guards and some european tourists uh, who were being abusive he took this he actually took the side of his egyptian workers mm. and was fired mm. um so and that's effectively that's how one of the reasons he became a, a freelance archaeologist for hire and why Car uh, carnarvon was able to hire him as his director of excavations for the Tutankhamun investigation. Mm. But also, uh, presumably, therefore, though, he was also a very savvy hire as well by Carnarvon because the guy, he knew the he knew the, the the state of play. He knew the who, where to go and who to talk to. Yeah, and I, th I think the other thing about Carter as well, I mean, he, he had the reputation of 
he got things done, mm. even though he was self-confessedly a very difficult personality. Mm. He wasn't an easy man to uh, get, on, get on with. Fa famously, he never had that we know of any particularly close relationships with anybody. Right. Um, right. And eventually died alone in London. Um, okay. But um, but yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a fascinating story, and it's not it's, it's not just about you know, modern scientific Egyptology suddenly being in the world spotlight no. for the first time. No, mm. um, but it's uh, but it's about how it was done. It's about the media. It's about the colonial relationships between Europeans and the Egyptians, mm. um, and, 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 and all against the background of this fascinating culture that you know people have been people in Europe and the West have found fascinating, certainly since Napoleon sent his scholars with his expedition to the Nile in the late 1700s. Yeah, yeah. Egyptoma um, Egyptomania, I think. Egyptomania, was, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, in fact, um, yeah. Uh, in fact, give, give, give me just one second. I'm just going to go and get something. No, that's okay. That's fine. Um, I'll I'll talk to, to the folks at home while, while you're doing that. Uh, the, uh, the thing that fascinates me is, is that even as far away as you know as LA, uh, you know you can see buildings that just were, to, um, that were being built in this Egyptian style. Due to this fascination. To... Oh, 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 here he's back. He's so back. I can hear you again. Oh, he can't hear us. There we go. Oh, there um... we can. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, um, that, that, I, I, I forgot to um, uh, get ready. One of my my, my visual aid. Um, touch, touch. I, I want. Yes. Oh, oh, touch, touch, touch. Yes. I see what you I see what you did there. No, I I, I just wanted to give I just wanted to give our um <laughs> our, our, our viewer really a, an example of how Egyptomania sort of penetrated into popular culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people who never considered themselves historians or archaeologists or whatever were suddenly involved in this story. Mm. Um this is a piece that has been in my family for as long as I can remember. I remember it as a child. Um it's a I don't think you can see that. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's a, a raw Dalton vase with an Egyptian lotus motif around the top. Yeah. Um, and it's a pattern that came out um, after the Tutankhamun excavation mm. um, in a piece of relatively high end. It's raw Dalton. It's yeah. named P Potter. Um, but it, it, it's taking its inspiration directly from ancient Egypt. Yeah, well, exactly, and, and I was just just saying to the folks at home while you were collecting that, you know, there's building architecture in places like Los Angeles, you know, and uh, uh, you know, and then because because it's interesting because you can definitely see play in places like actually interestingly enough the British Museum, the Bank of England, uh, the mm -hmm. Capitol Building in in Washington, you can see a Greco-Roman interest, but that particular yes. sort of Art Deco 1920s fascination with with lotus flowers on pots and and this slightly more organic um the version of of design certainly stemmed from this this time of discovery and, and as you say it must be it's, it must be something particularly to do with in that, that that discovery definitely and yeah absolutely and, I, and I, there's one other media um echo of two second camera echoing down to today and what we've been talking about in fact what we were talking about earlier in the show mm -hmm. Um, but one of the journalists um, who was uh, trying to cover the story against, uh, uh, was working, uh, wasn't working for the Times of London and therefore had the access and was trying to get the story um, by other journalistic means, mm -hmm. was um, a man called Arthur Wagel. Um, he's also famous for writing a book called, uh, I think it's Travels in Roman Britain. He, he wrote a lot of popular history and archaeology books in the 20s and 30s okay um now the fascinating thing about him is that he is one of the people that's linked to the beginnings of the fake news of the curse of the pharaohs mm. um yeah. he watched uh he allegedly watched um carnarvon joking um uh, as he went into the tomb and is reported to have said, if he goes down talking like that, or goes down in that kind of state of mind or whatever, I give him six weeks to live. Right. Um, now, uh, subsequently, um, obviously, we know famously Lord Carnarvon died of septicemia. Yes. 
Um, quite coincidentally. Um, Didn't he cut himself shaving or something? Or? He cut himself yeah. shaving and the bite became infected. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if, if he'd dabbed some iodine on it, history might have been completely different. Yeah. Mm. Um, but, and, and, and in fact, even Wade himself was alleged to be a victim of the, uh, of, of the, fake curse of the pharaohs when he died in the 1930s in fact because he'd been so associated with writing about Tutankhamun and so on um in, in fact uh he 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 had uh, it was a, a natural death i think he had a brain tumor or something like that but anyway uh, um he, he his, there was nothing suspicious about his his death in reality mm. um but um two other uh, but, but one, one other the other thing about wage is that the newspaper he was writing for um, and writing about the you know, the the fake curse of the pharaohs and so on was the Daily Mail. <laughs> and of course, the Daily Mail went on to be a paragon of of truth and non fakery. Um, and so so really, it's amazing how much things can change over a hundred years. The mail, the mail has been covering archaeology in the way the mail covers <clears throat> archaeology for over a century. <clears throat> Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, the express, but you know, we won't we won't, we won't talk yeah. about that today. Um, Absolutely. On 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 happy one other last media note about how ubiquitous the the, the king the Tutankhamun's tomb story became and how how much of a cultural touchstone it is, mm -hmm. um, as well as all the current you know the the the, the you know the, the, the um it, its use as a, a sort of a a, a waymark like Stonehenge something yeah. to something yeah. to. A, to judge other stories, other archaeological stories against yeah, the popular horror film. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, talking, about, it, it's absolutely about um, horror films, or at least sort of um, horror films for children, mm -hmm. um, because there's a very famous episode or um, storyline in Doctor Who uh, in the Patrick Troughton era uh, called Tomb of the Cybermen. Uh, there's a wonderful video um, again on YouTube. We'll link to it uh, where um, Christopher Frayling, the um, famous art, uh, art scholar, Professor Christopher Frayling. Um, talks about the um, the Tomb of the Cybermen storyline and the echoes it has of the actual Tomb of Tutankhamun, where even some of the the, the set was based on the Tutankhamun tomb. Um, mm. yeah, so it's um, uh, the Do Doctor Who's always had a very interesting, rather ambiguous relationship with archaeology. Yeah, um, with yeah. The, I think the the, the 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 one thing I've got against the uh, the David Tennant era Doctor is that that infamous line i don't like archaeologists yeah i, I was i point and laugh at them yeah um mm. well actually it, it, uh, it's interesting because you mentioned doctor who but also uh I, I do feel as though we also need to, to accept uh the 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 the, yeah, the, the central role of Tuth and, tutankhamun and, and egyptology in in shaping how so many people see archaeology via yeah. indiana jones as well you know i mean there's a reason yes. raiders happened in egypt it's because that's that's where you know that's just what hollywood what spielberg and lucas thought of when they thought of adventure archaeologists and uh and how to how to have a fight with nazis you know they went to egypt it's it's but, yeah and, and 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 i think what we mustn't forget as well this is all against the background of the growth of biblical archaeology in the 19th and yeah. uh, early mm. 20th century uh, but you, you you have organizations um the you have the various exploration societies so you have the egyptian exploration society that was funding egyptology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but um just just around the mediterranean you've got the palestine exploration society mm -hmm. um and a lot of it was a, lo a lot of the work was linked in terms of for example at the time people were trying to quote prove the bible mm -hmm. um some, and, pe some people um, are still trying to to prove the bible well yes, yeah yeah mm -hmm. um so you, you know Oh, uh, yeah. In the end, and I think why it's so fascinating. First of all, you have know, the Tutankhamun excavation. It is one of the most compelling stories in archaeology, mm. no question. Mm -hmm. um, how it came about, the, the personalities, the location, and then those wonderful, wonderful objects. You know, mm. when Carter is alleged to have said, yeah, you know, when he looked first looked into the the tomb chamber and that guttering candlelight, mm. and um, Carnarvon asking, "Can he see anything?" and he eventually says words along the lines of yes wonderful things or yes it's wonderful or you know whatever the quote actually was mm, mm. um it, it again it's one of those iconic moments in archaeology that can't be recreated any anywhere else really no no 
No, well, well, and there you go. A hundred years later, we're still talking about it. Um, yeah. Also, uh, I recently, uh, uh, I touched on this in the Spooky Archaeological Tales live stream I recently did, but uh, also uh, I recently uh, watched Nosferatu for the first time, oh. uh, which also is a hundred years old this year. It's, uh, it, it, in, in so many ways, actually, and not to drag us back into the, not to, you know, to be cursed to talk about this forever, but... Um, in some ways, actually, Tutankhamun and media grew up together in in the in the, mm. in the Western world psyche. I think in the twentieth century, uh, the development of of media, filmmaking as a story medium, and and the 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 visualization of the ancient world, and particularly, for example, um, ancient Egypt. Uh, in some ways, as a sort of an exotic counterpoint to what was seen as a very sterile, sober Roman world, um, is 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 actually arguably the story, yeah, the story of of uh, of our of our collective adventure imagination. You know, as much as it's a story about technological advancement and and academic pursuits, it's also yeah, you know, this the bedrock for adventuring for 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 so many people for decades. Well, for a hundred years now, it's it's really quite interesting when you when you when you start to think about it, um, and then talk about it well, at nauseam. <laughs> it's, 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 I'll, I'll talk about it ad nauseum so yeah. it's falling out there um, but no I mean just again just very quickly you, you mentioned Nosferatu Nosferatu was uh, basically the Dracula story except they didn't have the rights no no um, so it, uh, the, the, um, the it, it was Dracula by any other name which happened to Nosferatu Orlok. But, Count Orlok indeed yes. but in, again, one of these wonderful cultural connections. This is why you know archaeology isn't just archaeology. Archaeology is culture. Archaeology is community. Archaeology is politics. Mm, mm. Um, and um, in, in terms of archaeology is culture, um, Bram Stoker, who of course wrote Dracula, um, which was set in the history of the Bal in, of the Balkans and Vlad Tepes and so on, uh, also wrote a book called The Jewel of the Seven Stars, which mm -hmm. was published in 1903, and it's um, a, a sort of a, um, a a bright young barrister um, who is drawn into a plot to revive the mummy of ancient Egyptian Queen Terra. Oh, okay. Um, and um, that, you know that this is one of the earlier um, examples of the of, of the of the of the of the, of the mummy trope in yeah, horror the universal fiction. Universal mummy, yeah, mummy mon and m monsters, yeah. yeah that's okay. right. That's interesting. That's in well, okay, okay. One final thing on that then. Um, we only have Nosferatu to watch because a single copy survived in London. Uh, the the um, widow of of Stoker, who was looking after his estate, didn't give, as you say, didn't give permission to the to the German filmmakers to to make the movie or make a movie of the story uh, they made a story that's blatantly about dracula but they changed some names and, and some <laughs> bits and bobs um and made a classic film made an amazing film uh, certainly and, and you know yeah. playing with frame rates and screen dissolves and so on and so forth fantastic you know, really it's genuinely quite creepy actually still to watch um but um and also invented so many tr cinema tropes but anyway the point is as part of the legal action uh it was det it was uh it was writ that all all copies must be destroyed, and actually, it's only because of that single frame, uh, single uh, uh, reel of film, or single you know uh, uh, instance of the film, uh, that we actually have it to watch at all. So it's interesting as well how um, a little bit like Tutan Tutankhamun's tomb, uh, it's, the things that that come to us often are there by accident. You know, so many other tombs in the in the Valley of the Kings were looted or or uh, ruined through um, flooding, for example, hydrology or, or collapses. Mm. Um, but Tutankhamun's tomb made it through to be excavated using relatively modern techniques at the time, uh, and certainly recording and conservation techniques. Um, and this movie, this film, survived in a single copy. Um, it's I, I just find that quite poetic, quite beautiful. Uh, but anyway, we, 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 we've been rambling on about this for a while now. Tutankhamun, a hundred years. Uh, long, long may we be talking about about the boy king. Uh, but I'm sure we will. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah, but but finally, we're, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the the SOS Save Our Sands uh, uh, campaign that we we have talked about previously on Watching Brief. We'll link below to previous instances of the conversation. Um, but this is actually uh, a victory. A small campaigning group, a relatively small campaigning group, seemingly have uh, have have made 
uh, made the giant move on this issue. Uh, what's uh, what's what's happened, and and why has it happened? Well, it came about because the people who run the port of Dover wanted uh, over a million tonnes of sand and gravel uh, from the southwest Goodwin Sands, which is the nearest source for basically construction aggregates, because they had a £250 million project to revive Dover Western Docks. Mm. The Eastern Docks is the ferry port, which people might be familiar with, may even have used. Mm. Um, the Western Docks uh, is hardly used at all. It, it, it's, a, it's a stop for cruise liners some local fishing, uh, local yachties used it, but mm -hmm. it's it's really fairly run down, as is much of Dover. The, you know, it's an area of high deprivation. Mm. Um, and so six and a half years ago, Dover Western Docks Revival Project is put into being by the Port of Dover. Um, that's the company that runs Dover Docks. They're the sort of Goliath in what really is the David and Goliath story. Mm. Um, because the moment the project was announced, and it was announced... Um, as a as a as a win win for Dover, um, it was going to provide new jobs, new employ uh, employment during construction, but also once the the new Western Dock survival was established, um, people might actually stop rather than just coming off a ferry and and, and going through. There, there was going to be a sort of cultural and and, and entertainment quarter with um, restaurant high end restaurants and things like that. Um, it to basically you know revive the, the the tourist offer for for, for dover mm. and the um getting the aggregates from the goodwins was meant to be the greenest option because it was the shortest journey mm. that's for, for the dredger to make between the source of marine aggregates and the construction site okay however what they didn't take into account was how uh some local people and archaeologists and environmentalists would react to the idea of an industrial dredger going into what is widely regarded as one of the most sensitive environmental and archaeological marine environments around the coast of the UK. Mm. Mm. Um, the, the Goodwin sand, it's sand and gravel over chalk. It's a, um, a, a, a huge, basically, basic, a, a sandbar, a sand bank, um, running roughly north-south off mm -hmm. the coast of East Kent, mm -hmm. um, but from just north of Dover, past a town called Deal, and up to the Isle of Thanet. Okay. Um, it created a massively important natural harbour called... Um, a, a roads, as they uh, as it's called, um, off Deal, which may, made it one of the main um, naval anchorages for the Royal Navy. Uh, in in the in the period of sail, uh, Nelson famously stayed in Deal, and, and, and while his ship was anchored off uh, you know, and protected by the Goodwins. So you could, um, you, could also, say, you could say it was a big deal. Uh, you're ahead of me. You are so far ahead. <laughs> oh, oh, of me. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> as if I'd ever make a pun like that. Uh, <laughs> but, so, no, uh, but but as well as having a reputation for for protecting ships in, 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 and being a safe anchorage, mm -hmm. a safe port in a storm, if you like. Mm. Um, it was also, it also had the reputation of being a ship swallower, as, mm. as sometimes called in popular culture. It, it, if the winds were wrong, and famously in the uh, hurricane, I think it was 1712, but anyway, the, the great hurricane of the early 18th century, um, the whole um, four, I think it was, Royal Navy ships of the line were blown onto the Goodwin Sands and loss with the loss of most of their crews. Wow. Um, and um, the um, uh, uh, the most famous one is um, uh, a ship called the Stone, HMS Sterling Castle, mm. um, who which has been emerging periodically from the Goodwins and um, has been subject of ongoing archaeological work. And mm. a lot of controversy, actually. She, she's arguably as important as the Mary Rose in terms of the evolution of ship structures. Mm. Um, and better preserved, right? Um, because basically, she sank into the sand and was filled with sand, and and, and is the absolutely archetypal, you know, buried, uh, you know, sunken galleon time capsule. But that, but then also, uh, I seem to recall that the that the campaign, uh, the Save Our Sands campaign, were also making a big thing of, um, uh, what's so making a big thing? They were highlighting that this had been a location where, uh, for example, Second World War aircraft had gone down as well, weren't they? That's right. Mm. I mean, basically, what happened was a group of 
local people um, in Deal, mm. led by two women, in fact, um, Joe Thompson and Fiona Punter, mm. put together effectively a consortium of experts to campaign uh, to, to argue basically it was the wrong project and that there were alternatives but also that the work that had been done by the port of dover and particularly the port of dover's environmental and archaeological consultants wasn't up to standard it wasn't mm. fit for purpose mm. so for example the initial uh, application for a marine license because marine aggregates have to be uh, taken out under license from the marine management organization there's a whole licensing and consultation process the initial document which was 1500 pages it was huge mm -hmm. that the port of dover's consultant royal hasconing submitted on on dover's behalf was pulled apart and basically um part significant parts of it were destroyed by the Save Our Sands campaign, who said, basically, this is the wrong project in the wrong place. It's too destructive, a very sensitive archaeological and marine environment. One of the issues being, as you've just said, the area um, contains known and an unknown number of other aircraft that came down during particularly World War II, mm. particularly during the Battle of Britain. People might remember that a Dornier bomber was uh, taken off of the Goodwin Sands by the RAF Museum a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It's the last remaining Dornier 17 in the world mm. that's known. Mm. Um, you know, so th th there's really sensitive archaeology, ancient and modern, on the Goodwins, much mm. of it unknown. Uh, when it came to the aircraft wrecks, for some reason best known to themselves, Royal Hasconi didn't talk to the Ministry of Defence before submitting their application, even though it's illegal under the Protection of Military Remains Act to touch, let alone damage or destroy a military aircraft covered under the Act without a licence, right. which you have to get in advance. You can't apply for a licence retrospectively no. and say, oops, sorry, my dredger just trashed through that aeroplane. Mm, mm. Um, anyway, which is which, of course, which but so which is of course presumably is difficult because my understanding is that the sands are always moving, and mm -hmm. so actually locating these these artifacts uh, accurately so 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 that you can avoid dredging and basically yeah. mitigation was almost impossible, I suppose. It, it, it's more complicated even than that because um, expert marine archaeologists and and, and um, cards on the table. I've been following this for some time, but and also it is an area of expertise of of, of mine. Mm. Um, but um, the issue around locating sunken aircraft, the standard technique that was being used to survey the sands was magnetometry. Uh -huh. But most World War II aircraft were made of either um, the uh, early ones uh, of wooden canvas and the only ferrous objects were basically engine blocks not even all, uh, whole engines um weapons guns and bombs might also show up mm -hmm. in a magnetometry survey if it was fine-tuned enough mm. um and, and later aircraft that are entirely aluminium again you could have you know, a four engine bomber but the magnetic signature might actually be just you know small and dispersed yeah, because of the, the the limited number of ferrous artifacts within that large, uh, larger artifact, and and experts argued that this wasn't taken into account by the consultant. No. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, it went to an unprecedented three separate public consultations. Um, the license was eventually granted. It was judicially reviewed in the High Court and the. Uh, Save Our Sands campaign crowdfunded the judicial review. They lost the judicial review, but they carried on campaigning. And a couple of weeks ago, the Port of Dover announced that basically they'd thrown up their hands and they weren't going to continue mm. with the project. Mm. Um, now, the current uh, head of the Port of Dover is a guy called Doug Bannister. Um, he's the second person to have tried to oversee this. The uh, previous one I'll come back to in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
uh, in a press release, they said, um, this is a win for us all in that, uh, this, the, um, the, the withdrawal of the plan to, to dredge the Southwest Goodwins. This is a win for us all. It enables us to move forward with confidence in developing land for new local employment opportunities at a time when such opportunities are greatly needed and helps unify our community by removing an issue that has in places divided opinion. Hmm. And the local MP, Natalie Elphick, also welcomed the move. She's been uh, working with the Save Our Sounds campaign, but also acting as a sort of go-between with the Port of Dover, being the, the, the local MP. She said, um, I remain fully behind the port and its excellent ambitions for development, but I've also held concerns about the proposed dredging of the Goodwin Sands. I'm delighted that the Port of Dover has listened to those who hold concerns within our community and has been active in finding a way forward that works to both promote and secure jobs and investment, while also respecting and preserving the special marine environment and habitat of the Goodwin Sands. And then she said, it's an excellent outcome and I pay tribute to the work of the Port of Dover in finding a solution and to Goodwin Sands SOS team for raising this important issue. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of attempts of, of bridge building and healing going on there because at times, particularly under Mr. Bannister's predecessor, mm -hmm. um, he it, it's been pretty ac acrimonious. Um, the I'm, I'm actually careful what I say here, but um, Bannister's predecessor of chief executive was a guy called Tim Waggett. Uh, and it was under his um, tenure that the project was launched. And when the SOS Save Our Sands campaign began, Wagger took a pretty aggressive stance in opposing it, yeah. including setting up a website called Deliver for Dover and taking out attack ads in the local newspapers and talking about... Um, uh, a small group of ill-informed outsiders mounting attack, mounting an attack on the economic future of the port of Dover. Right. Um, now, that was it. Was very Trumpian or Johnsonian. It's you know you're either for us or against us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and because the SOS campaign was based at Deal, um, he was accused of trying to divide the local community of East Kent, who were all facing the same issues of. You know, deprivation and um, a, 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 the economy after Brexit and so on. Mm, mm. Um, now, it may or may not be a coincidence um, that um, he, he um, shall we say, he resigned to speak to seek new opportunities just before the license was actually granted. Um, it was also two weeks after the Port of Dover, his employer, were handed a dossier about his behaviour that was um, after allegations that he'd been uh, bullying and behaving inappropriately. Mm. Um, a, um, they commissioned a, uh, Port of Dover commissioned a, an HR organisation, an independent HR organisation to report into Waggot. And so coincidentally, Waggot resigned within two weeks of that report coming out. Um, Bannister has taken a much more sensitive route and i think it's ended up in a in a, in a space where um the bridges were built the conversations were had dover realized the port of dover realized that the project had been misconceived mm -hmm. if you like that even um that they they hadn't been able to start it yet it, the license was about to lapse they'd have to renew and save our sands would have opposed any renewal so they weren't going to be able to do it anytime soon Right. Whew, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> and so I suppose what what's uh, um, what's the uh, I should, so I should just say I'm I'm itching to comment on the idea that we always make room for people to coincidentally resign from problematic scenarios. I, I'm not saying there was a problematic scenario. And everything it, 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 that the I'm talking about hypothetical other things when I say this for legal purposes, but it's interesting how I, that bothers me. It always bothers me when that happens. But anyway, but but mm. what what might this mean? What can we take away from this as as the as an archaeological uh, community, um, uh, particularly at the moment? Uh, you know, again, you know, yeah, sure, the uh, the the investment zones are currently on the back burner if if not downright scrapped uh by the sunak's government um but uh the the tendency as we're about to hear i think next week to see 
humanities, history, heritage and culture as one of the first things that will get economically cut uh, or one of the first, uh, one of the last things that will be considered legally when it comes to seeing potential to make money either in the landscape or elsewhere. Uh, what what can we take from this sort of campaign? Because to me, to my mind, it's, it sounds like uh, doggedness is one of one of the uh, the virtues here. Uh, having lost a judicial review, I think a lot of people would have just gone home and, and said, "Oh well, we we tried our best," but they uh, they continued and and it seemed that uh, that they that that you know. Well, as we were saying earlier, the long, the long arch of the universe tended towards justice. So, um, what what can we learn from this? Right, uh, I don't want to go into this too much because we're hoping to get uh, Joe Thompson and Fiona Punter from the um, Save yeah. Our Sounds campaign on on the show uh, in the next couple of weeks, mm -hmm. um, and 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 they're, they're and they're the people who are absolutely at the sharp end um, mm -hmm. who can talk about that more 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 than I can. Certainly, what I've observed. And one of the reasons I wanted to follow the story up um, and, and I've followed it, as I say, for the last six and a half years as they've been campaigning mm. is uh, there are a number of things I think in play here. And I'll just highlight them now and we'll go into them in more detail, hopefully, when we, when we, um, when we talk to, 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 to Joe and Fiona. Mm -hmm. But the first thing is that in terms of the campaign, they were doggy they didn't give up mm -hmm. they built a very powerful coalition of independent experts they didn't just say this is terrible we don't want it to happen they said mm. this is terrible we don't want it to happen and this is why it can't happen yeah mm. Mm. and they backed it up with expert voices from the natural environment community from the archaeological community mm. and in that they were aided and abetted um they obviously hadn't intended it by the quality of the work that was handed down by Royal Hasconi and the other consultants involved for the Port of Dover. I'd be very interested in seeing the correspondence between the Port of Dover and the consultants when certain events happened, like, for example, they were forced to have urgent meetings with the Ministry of Defence because they hadn't even asked them hmm. about their, their point of view with regards to the Protection of Military Remains Act and the known aircraft that were down on the Goodwins. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It was... Uh, I, 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 and, 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 and you know, we'll link to the articles that uh, I've written and some, and some other pieces. But I remember writing at the time, you know, it was inexplicable how an international consultant could not take into account. You know, the first the first thing you write in a desktop assessment is the legal background that you're mm -hmm. working within. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the protection of military remains is absolute, you know, and it's not as if it hasn't been. It's not well known. It's been around since 1986. And the archaeological lead on the project, Wessex Archaeology, have done work on military aircraft under the Protection of Military Remains Act. They know all about it. Mm, mm. And yet it wasn't referenced in that initial application. Whereas they did reference the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, who actually have no legislative role. No. No. They take over when human remains have been recovered. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question was, were Royal Hasconing incompetent or were they ignoring something that they knew was going to be an issue and hoping that nobody else would notice because it would make life easier for their client? Mm. Now, I've got no evidence either way on that, mm. but the question was asked. Mm. Same thing was asked about the, um, the, the, the surveys that were done. That you know, were, were they as comprehensive as they could have been, should have been, in an environment that sensitive, or did they do the bare minimum? Mm. Um, it uh, 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 and it went on. I mean, what, one of the other one of the other issues that never actually got litigated properly was was it appropriate in such a sensitive marine environment for the dredging to go ahead and for the recording to take place like a pipeline watching brief when the effectively when the bucket came out of the, out of the water with big chunks of aluminium or big chunks of work wood from mm. a ship mm. in in when it's already been trashed through and possibly observed and recorded by somebody who might not even have been a trained archaeologist, but was somebody who had been given enough training to spot potential material. Yeah. And would that person have the authority on a ship where the captain is the absolute last you know, rule um, and is responsible to his employer and his employer's contractor uh, as a contractor, rather 
to his employer and 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 the, and the person who's whose contract it's with would, you know, would they operate on a precautionary principle all the time uh, these, the, the, I mean, these are these are good questions. It, 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 I mean, ironically, it does feel as though you are going into into quite a lot of of of, of detail. These are here. these are questions. I'm, these are questions I'm going to ask in more detail. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, as, 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 as and when. But no, look. Bottom line, and uh, uh, it's the the question I'm asking really at the uh, at the end of the article I've written, the upsum I've written about this in the pipeline, mm -hmm. um, and it's the one I'm going to I, again preview the question. Uh, but I'll ask. I'll ask our audience now, and, and perhaps you know if you've got experience of this, good or bad, please let us know below the line. But the question I'm asking is, given the performance of Royal Haskonings and and other parts of the consultation, I mean, another thing, you know, they got the wave modelling for the yachting marina completely wrong. Mm. It was unusable because the entrance became unsafe. Mm. The mm. waves were too fierce for the yachts to come in and out safely. I am trying to bring this episode to a close, Andy. Um, yeah. I know you are, but the, 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 look. Okay, there's, there, put it this way: there's a there's a lot to explore here. I'm just throwing out some tasters, yes. and I'm, throwing, I'm going to throw out what I'm going to throw. Out. This is I am going to end on this. It's one last question, okay? And that is, this particular project has been brought to an end by its instigator because it says circumstances have changed. Yeah, but it could have gone ahead. But what Save Our Sands proved. And we'll discuss in more data, detail when we talk to them. Is that people, organisations involved in putting that plan together under the current system of licensing and rules and regulations around planning and offshore planning and so on, basically, in parts at least, got it horribly wrong. Mm. Yes. And how many other projects have gone ahead with data that was equally horribly wrong, but weren't questioned by a tenacious group of people who got together that coalition of independent experts? Mm. And I suppose I would just very quickly add to that the and um, what role therefore does do an arch do archaeologists have in that? You know, is it is it our role to advocate for a project because it it's good for the economy or is it our role to advocate for the uh the the conversation at the very least that that the, the other people that in this instance sos were advocating for um yeah. i mean frankly i mean obviously they, they were advocating for for just preserving the site but if you want to be if you want to try and pursue some sort of archaeological neutrality because i don't expect everyone to, to cross the line to being always activists on behalf of, an, of a historic site at the very mm. least maybe just being somewhere in the middle uh there's 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 a, there's a question there to, to to examine as well uh there are uh, there are many questions and that's why it's such a fascinating story yeah and now i'm gonna shut up and i'm gonna go away i'm gonna go away and i'm gonna enjoy a um the dramatization of some real world events re uh, it's to do with named people and known history and um it's been dramatized and it's currently available to view and it's fantastic and it's called sas rogue heroes and it's on bbc <laughs> one on a sunday evening it's by the guys who created peaky blinders oh god and, I, thought uh, gonna, I thought you were going to talk about about the film that film oh yes we haven't got time what film? <laughs> um good question right okay we're gonna leave it there for this week um we'll we'll, we'll see you guys next week uh, hopefully this has been a fun uh, return after after in my case having a slightly poorly week off um and uh yeah meaty topics on the horizon and some good interviews as well also we still have to talk to, to um prospect arcs as well in the near future so i hope hopefully. we're still gonna be able to do that yeah yeah, yeah yeah right guys Take care. Do comment below. If you have any news stories uh, or instances that you think we should take a look at, please do get in touch. DMs are open and uh, Mr. Brockman has various other means to secure means to contact him via his website um, at the pipeline. And, and still on Twitter. Well, and still on Twitter. And, and so am I. I'm still on Twitter as well. You know. I know, I know. I know. Most I know. people are still on Twitter in some form. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Bye, guys. That's a whole other story. We're not going to go there. Bye, guys. Cheers. Take care. See you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.